David Larmer, welcome to the New School at Commonweal. Thank you. David, uh, you are a writer, lecturer, and editor and the program director of the Scientific and Medical Network. And actually, let me just stop right there and ask you, since we're gonna cover so many things, what is the Scientific and Medical Network? Well, the network was founded in 1973 um, by senior scientists, doctors, and educationalists um, who represent various different approaches, but all of them were interested in science and medicine and philosophy uh, and had mystical experiences. And, and this was the important point, um, that they had experienced something beyond the physical world, a sense of unity, a sense of transcendence. And they wanted to expand science to bring that into the picture, uh, not only scientifically and philosophically, but also existentially from the point of view of what this means to be a human being and to expand and deepen the idea of what it means to be a human being. And so we, we now explore this interface, particularly between science, consciousness, and spirituality. And we have members all around the world. The uh, network looks extraordinary. And I was mentioning to you just before we started that I actually uh, believe I need to join it because um, it's not entirely inexpensive, what is it, 60 pounds a year? It is. Which is, I guess that translates to around $100 a year, something like that. Something like that, but there, there are concessionary rates. And so you yeah, right. Pay as but much nonetheless, as I can't, I, I need to join it at that rate. But you publish an extraordinary uh, magazine. Tell us about that. Yes, well, it used to be just called Network News, and, and it was cyclo-styled and duplicated. Um, and when I took it over, which is number 32, um, it was just a black and white folded leaflet, um, maybe 30, 40 pages, uh, and really had not, no kind of design in it at all. And then gradually over the years, um, it became Network Review, and more recently Paradigm Explorer. And I've now done 103 issues, um, I think, you know, over the last 35 years. And it's, an, it's a journal that we produce three times a year with articles, news, and a very extensive book review section, which is the thing that I major on myself, which I've developed, so that I review some 150 books a year at various lengths um, across a number of disciplines, not just science and medicine and health, but also philosophy, consciousness studies, ecology and politics. Yes, uh, you and I have similar reading habits. Uh, I think that the number of 150 books a year would, would understate for either of us the number of books we actually read a year. Uh, but the fact that you review 150 a year is, is, uh, is wonderful. Uh, you are also the president of the Recon Trust, which was founded by Sir George Trevelyan after hearing a lecture on Rudolf Steiner, uh, Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy in 1942. Uh, tell us about the Recon Trust and who Sir George Trevelyan was. Well, <clears throat> George was a great mentor of mine. Um, I've called a spiritual father, um, if you like, because uh, he was the same generation as my father, but he understood my spiritual side, which my father uh, was not able to. It just wasn't his, his remit in, in, in that sense. Um, and we used to have lunches together when I both lived, we both lived in the Cotswolds. And so I knew, I knew George very well. And initially what happened was that I, I invited him to give a, a, a talk at Winchester College where I was teaching. And I was a little bit nervous because I didn't know what these terribly intelligent boys um, would make of George, but he captivated them. And we had a, a lovely dinner afterwards. And thereafter, I got to know him better and better. And, and uh, he, as you say, founded Recon Trust uh, in 1971 when he retired from being principal of Attingham College in Shropshire. And the Recon was the local mountain. And it was for spiritual education. And it ran for 40-something years. Um, he, he was the initial um, founder and president. And, and then I got involved in the 1980s as a trustee. I was chairman of trustees 
um, for a long time. And then I became executive vice president and eventually president until it closed down, having finished its, accomplished its mission uh, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, but it, it did a huge um, amount, uh, among which was the Mystics and Scientists Conference, which in fact was jointly arranged with the network in 1978. And Fritjof Capra was one of the first speakers there, and he also spoke at the 40th anniversary. And so this continues, this Mystics and Scientists Conference still continues, although we had to postpone last year's event to this year, and it's still going to be online, which is slightly ironic because the topic is reconnecting with nature. And so we'll be connecting through screens instead of reconnecting with nature. Uh, so Recon Trust was really a beacon of light uh, from the 1970s for maybe 25 years um, or so. How wonderful. Uh, you are also the former president of the Swedenborg Society. And for those who don't know, uh, say a little about uh, who Swedenborg was, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, and uh, what the society does. Yes, well, <clears throat> I found out about the society in 1974, which is my last year at university. And I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I found out about Swedenborg. And the answer is that I, I was reading um, one of Baudelaire's poems. I was studying French poetry and French literature. And about page three, there's a very famous poem called Correspondences. And so I was analyzing this poem and looking up the notes. And in one of the notes, it said that Baudelaire got this idea of correspondences from, from Swedenborg. So I thought, that's interesting. Maybe we ought to find out about him. And so I borrowed a biography of him by Thomas Trowbridge um, from the university library. And one evening I was in my room and I decided just to sit down and read it. And I found this was an extraordinary experience because here was a man who lived in the 18th century who was a scientist, mathematician, uh, geologist, what we now call a neuroscientist, philosopher, psychologist, engineer. I mean, his expertise was, was quite a mathematician, was quite extraordinary. And what happened to him is that he had an opening in his 50s where he suddenly was able to see into the spiritual world. And he started writing a series of books on the spiritual meaning of the Old Testament and particularly the Gospels and Revelation. And then he also wrote his, one of his most important books was, was uh, Heaven and Hell. Um, and so he recounts his experience of the spiritual worlds um, in very matter of fact terms. And that's what impressed me. It's all done in very matter of fact terms, fact, matter of fact Latin. Um, and he also, and this was the other thing that influenced me a lot, um, was he wrote The True Christian Religion, uh, his interpretation, and also Divine Love and Wisdom. And, and I began to realize that divine love and wisdom um, was the essence of spirituality, um, which then you know, enabled me to understand Peter Dunoff, Ben Seduno better, but we'll come on to that maybe a little bit later. We will indeed. Um, and the Swedenborg Society, sorry, you asked about that. Just a, a brief, um, this, it began in 1810, and so it's been going for over 200 years, mm -hmm. and has had some quite famous scientists even as presidents. Um, William Crookes was, was one of those. And, and it's dedicated to publishing and, and publicizing the work of Swedenborg, and, and it has a, a headquarters in London and a library. And, and right near the British Museum, actually. Right near the British Museum, absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, a beautiful building. Um, we actually have a very beautiful Swedenborg church here in San Francisco. I don't know if you knew that. Mm. But uh, I didn't. Very, yeah, very beautiful. And uh, another closely connected thing to Swedenborg uh, is that uh, you are or have been uh, um, the vice president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, which I'm very familiar with. But what I didn't know 
is that the website refers me immediately to the Society for Psychical Research, which was founded in London in 1882, the first scientific organization to examine psychic and paranormal uh, phenomena. And so what I didn't know, if, if it's correct, is that the International Association for Near-Death Studies seems to be intimately connected with the Society for Psychical Research. Well, I'm, <clears throat> that, uh, that's slightly news to me. Uh, I mean, really? Obviously, the SPR is very interested in, in near-death experiences, but the IANS UK, which is what I was vice president of, um, you know, folded up in probably the mid-1990s. You know, we ran for about 10 years. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, and so the, the, it's, it's something that, it's a subset, if you like, of spiritual experiences um, in one respect, um, which relates it to the work of Sir Alistair Hardy. Um, right. But the SPR is much wider than, you know, than all sorts of different you know, altered states of consciousness and research ar around that. Well, I guess if it folded up, perhaps the reason the website takes me there is, uh, is as a reference, but it might be worth looking into. In any case, I went to uh, IAND uh, and found myself at the uh, Society for Psychical Research. Have you been involved with the Society for Psychical Research? <clears throat> yes, I, I have. I've been a member for 35 uh, years, something, something right. like that. And so I, you know, I read its journal. I don't, don't. Uh, I have given a couple of couple of lectures um, at the SPR, but not for quite some time. Um, and, and Bernard Carr, who's the president. So uh, you started uh, back to your uh, formal biography as a merchant banker. Then you taught philosophy and modern languages at Winchester College. Where is Winchester College, and what is it all about? Well, Winchester is <clears throat> um, about um, sixty miles southwest of London. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has a cathedral and the college, which was founded by William of Wickham, who was Bishop of Winchester, in 1382. Uh, and so it's one of the great schools of, uh, of England, probably one of the most intellectual um, and, and particularly producing scientists and, and lawyers in, in terms of old Wickhamists. So in, from Freeman, so, uh, Freeman Dyson, for instance, who recently died, the physicist, he, he was educated as uh, he was a scholar at Winchester. And I think the unusual thing about a Winchester education is its, its, its depth of generality, because you not only you know, specialize in science or the humanities, but even if you're a scientist, you, you still do general studies, which is called DIV. And in DIV, you, you have to read four books, which aren't in your discipline at all, each half, each term, and then write essays about these every two weeks. So in other words, even if you're a scientist, you have to continue writing essays and arguing cases and, 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 and so on, um, which I think you know, gives a, a, a very interesting depth and breadth um, to a Winchester education. Now, now I, I, had a, you know, I spent six very happy and productive and interesting years there. Wonderful. So uh, with that brief overview of your uh, uh, published uh, 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 biographical sketch, uh, let me, uh, before we get into your, your, uh, your work uh, in more depth, let me just ask you a few sort of contextual questions. Where were you born and raised? Well, in Fife um, in Scotland, so I was born just outside St. Andrews, uh, and my family had a house um, about 10 miles from St. Andrews, which was bought by my grandfather, Sir Robert Lorimer, <clears throat> in 1916. And the Lorimers were associated um, with more with Edinburgh. Uh, my great-grandfather was, uh, was a moral philosopher who was also a professor of international law at Edinburgh University from 1862 until he died in 1890. And then my mother's side um, came from Dundee, which is not very far away. Uh, and they, they ran a jute business um, between 1760 and 1923 when it was bought up and, and folded. And, and so they, 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 in fact, were responsible for 
as a family for the founding of Dundee University and Abertay University and, and some chairs at Edinburgh University. And, and this was Sir David Baxter, who was <clears throat> one of the, the great sort of magnates and chairman of Baxter Brothers. Um, and his, one, one, his nephew, uh, William Edward Baxter, who was an MP, member of parliament, um, and they're quite prominent um, in, in public life. And then there was another f third one who was the first chairman of um, the um, Dundee University Court called Sir George Washington Baxter. Rather wonderful. He should have been called George Washington. And, and so he was, he, he was another of uh, the sort of prominent members of, of my mother's family. What is your first memory? Well, it's an interesting one. Um, my first memory is being in a pram <clears throat> um, and asking my mother if I could go and see the sheep, sheepies. And she said no. <laughs> um, and I, I, I was a bit upset. Um, but she did look at things a little bit as a battle of wills. Um, and she was not going to give in to my request um, because it, she was going to be in charge. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's my earliest memory. But I, I also have memories which are a little bit later, but which are important uh, as I was reflecting in preparation for our conversation. My brother and I used to spend a lot of time climbing trees. And so I, once we got into the tree and up the tree, and sometimes it was by myself, and I had various favorite trees that I used to spend time in. And I realized years later that this was, in fact, a kind of contemplative experience, um, that you were being in the tree. Uh, so you get to the top, and you might be looking over the top, or you might be looking down, or looking across into the foliage, the beech trees, the chestnut trees. Um, but of course, I didn't know about meditation or anything at that point. But it struck me in retrospect that um, this was a form of contemplative experience. And I'd probably spend at least half an hour up the tree um, before I came down again, sometimes longer. What were you like as a relatively young child, say, a, your first sense of what you were like in retrospect, uh, say, six or eight or something like that? Well, I think I was one of these uh, quite sensitive um, children, and, and I, I was never one of the group, never one of the crowd. Uh, and that caused me a bit of grief um, at various points in my education, uh, because if you're the odd one out, then you're the one that gets bullied. Mm. And, and the sensitive people tend to get bullied by the less sensitive, which I now kind of understand. Um, um, but it's a painful thing to go through at the time um, because you, you feel excluded and rejected. But then at the same time, maybe it helps you kind of stand on your own feet um, once you've got through that feeling of pain and, and rejection. And um, so I was, I, was aware of, I was aware of that, particularly when I went to boarding school um, at the age of eight. I think that's when it became more apparent because then you're among boys and then so you're subject to kind of group psychology and also um, <clears throat> rough um, rugby games and things which I hated. I was quite good at kicking, kicking the ball, but I wasn't any good in scrums and that kind of thing. I much, much would have preferred to be to play golf. Hmm. Uh, when did you when did you first have what in retrospect you might recognize as either an awareness of spirit or an, uh, a non-ordinary experience of consciousness, whether it was non-ordinary or ordinary. But what is your first memory of either an awareness of spirit or a non-ordinary state of consciousness? Well, I think probably in connection with the tree climbing that I, that I mentioned, um, because I think there was more going on um, than I realized at the time. Um, and it was hugely nourishing. So that when you're in a tree in the summer and the leaves are fluttering gently, 
and and then you're looking you've got perspective um on life because you're looking across you're looking down but you've also achieved something by climbing up the tree and sometimes it wasn't that easy and um, although you obviously often go up the same trees and so you would sort of get to know the tree um, and then I think just being in nature, being in nature, walking, and the birds, smells, and those sort of, they, 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 weren't, they weren't intense experiences, but certainly experiences of timelessness and, and feeling connected and, and a sense of belonging, if I can put it like that. Where did you go to boarding school? Well, I went to Edinburgh. Um, a place my father had also been, a place called Cargillfield, um, which had about 120 boys and, and was, I mean, I think it was founded in about 1890, maybe slightly before. So it go, went back quite a long way. So I went in 1960, um, where the new headmaster had just come in. <clears throat> and it had a, a regime of cold baths um, in the morning and, and corporal punishment. And there was a lot of caning um, for you know, various activities. In fact, what I was caned for um, was mainly reading after lights were out. Mm. So that, again, in retrospect, you can see how um, that connects up with later parts of my life. Although I wasn't a great reader, in fact, at that, at that time. What were you interested in in that period of time? What was your sort of focal identity? Well, I, I just did, I did the, the work that I was meant to do. I was good at languages, particularly at French. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I enjoyed. And I now, in fact, I now live in France, you know, which is um, a joy. I wasn't keen on sports. Um, and I hadn't really, at that point, discovered my ability in athletics either. That came at a, um, a later stage. Mm -hmm. um, I did play in the cricket team. Um, briefly as a fast bowler um, and I think my best score was three three for three <laughs> so that gave me a little bit of um, of kudos just in my last term and um, uh, but it's I don't remember those years with with great fondness I I have to say where did you go to you did you go directly to university after that no then I went to Eton um, so at the age of 13 and I went to Eton College, where my uncle had been, and my great uncle. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that, that period between 13 and 18, as I'm sure you remember yourself, it's very formative, because you arrive as a child and you leave as a, as a young adult. Um, so you go through all those, those phases in, in that 13 to 18 um, period, um, interacting with your peers, and then, then developing, as you said before, just a kind of better sense of yourself. And, and who did you become? What were you like in that period at Eton? Well, I wasn't an intellectual. Uh, I wasn't terribly interested in, in my work. Um, I was primarily an athlete. Mm. Um, and so I, I played a lot of um, ball games, so fives, which you play with your hands and a glove. So I was in the team <clears throat> for that. And also squash. I was in the squash team. Mm. Um, but my main thing was athletics. Um, and so I discovered in my second year um, that I was quite good at long distance running. Uh -huh. um, and I became, I, my first year, we had this huge um, cross country steeplechase. And I remember I came 327th equal um, in the first year. In the second year, I came 37th. And the year after that, I came second. And, and then then in the senior steeplechase, I, uh, which I graduated to the following year, I then I came second to the person who'd won it before, uh -huh. the year before. And then in my final year, um, I won it by five minutes. How? Oh, and wow. I don't think, and, and I broke the record. So I don't think anybody had won it by by such a large margin. <laughs> it's interesting the parallels in our lives. I went to uh, a. Uh, preparatory school in New Hampshire called Phillips Exeter Academy, which is probably somewhat like Eaton. And, uh, and my athletic uh, career was uh, in track and long distance running. Okay. I was um, the first uh, student in living memory to be both the head of the 
twice weekly newspaper and a varsity runner. So uh, that was my okay. Distinction. Uh, Very interesting. But, I mean, university. I, I I was British universities and Scottish universities, three thousand meters steeplechase champion. So that was oh, my, how wonderful. Well, you were much more adept than I. That was my um, my kind of distance, if you like. And and what university was that? That was St Andrews. Oh, okay. I, I went to University of St Andrews in no, 1970, so just over 50 years ago. And, and I read French, German, economics, and philosophy. And you later were a trustee of the St. Andrews Prize. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. That was very different. I, I, I got that invitation from a, a friend of mine called Sir Crispin Tickell, and And he was the warden of Green College in Oxford and had been the UN ambassador um, in New York. Um, and, and Mexico, and he's somebody I got to know actually through the kind of psych, SPR um, you know, connection. And he, he's, one, he's still alive, he's, he's 90, and he's, he's one of the great environmentalists um, who you know, wrote Margaret Thatcher's speech that she gave at the United Nations in 1989. So that goes back, that goes back a while. So he's an extraordinary man, and he was the founding chairman of the St Andrews Prize, and he was kind enough to invite me to, to be on the prize panel for a few years, which was, was a very interesting job because you've got these projects being put forward from around the world, and which you then heard the briefing from the, from the finalists. And then you made a collective decision about who should win the prize for that particular year. Sir Crispin Tickell gave a lecture in San Francisco that I attended probably 20 years ago. And what stands out in my memory is that he said that uh, although, you know, global warming climate change was on the horizon, that we were overdue for another ice age and that we needed to be careful about um, uh, carbon emissions uh, because we might need them at a certain point, which was just a really I'm interesting I'm observation. I'm not sure he would hold that view now, but I, I mean, doubt it. I doubt yeah, it. It was 20 he years. He was also before. very interested in environmental <clears throat> refugees. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, would bring I a lot share of that interest now. deeply. Mm. Um, before we go on, uh, I just want to create a little psychic space here to acknowledge that you were kind enough to send me uh, a number of your poems. And uh, I'd love to ask you uh, just to read us a poem of your choice. Yes, thank you. Well, I'll read you the one I've, um, I've just written, um, uh, which is called Deliverance. And you'll, you'll see why in the poem as uh, delivery and deliverance. Every year, the earth gives birth to new life. But what about us? Can we give birth to a new culture, a culture of love, a culture of wisdom, a culture of truth, a culture of justice, a culture of freedom, a culture of kindness, a culture of beauty? Or will we remain huddled in darkness trapped in fear, stifled by control, cowed into compliance, cancelled by censors, unable to breathe freely, sleepwalking backwards into digital slavery. Deep grief wells up, a sense of human future lost, of time being short, earth in the balance, breakdown and breakthrough coming into view. Will this culture of hope be stillborn again? Or can we finally deliver this new world together with courage and love? The earth has long awaited this moment of deliverance from violence and secrecy, from deception and evil. The world can torture and crucify the good but the light of love endures, comes through. Human hearts crack open. The birth pangs of one humanity, awakening oh so slowly, agonizingly, 
emerging from the cave of suffering to greet the rising sun. How beautiful. Let, let's just sit with that for a moment. That has the sense of being part of some kind of uh, inner journey. Yes. Um, it was reflected out of an inner journey that I, I did over the weekend. And there were many more images and themes to it. Um, but I had the sense of being both individual and collective, and that I was tuning into not only my own agenda of birth, death, and rebirth, and transcendence, um, but also this agonizing period for the human, where we have a chance, in a sense, to emerge into something new, to create a, a regenerative future, a healing future, and not a continuation of the systems that we have at the moment. And it struck me that from a divine point of view, this requires infinite patience because we're such slow learners um, collectively. That And so infinite compassion, I wrote somewhere uh, in the same notebook, requires infinite patience. And I feel that's what our spiritual teachers have to have for us normal people. They have to have an enormous amount of patience because we don't quite get it or we don't take it seriously. We don't do our practice. And, and so you know, we carry on as before when we should be transforming from caterpillar into butterfly. Mm. Speaking of spiritual teachers, um, you are the editor of an extraordinary book about a, a spiritual teacher that I didn't know about until um, uh, we began to talk, Prophet for Our Times, The Life and Teachings of Peter Dunov. Um, there's a quote on the cover uh, from Albert Einstein, the whole world bows down before me. I bow down before the master Peter Dunov. Uh, you actually learned Bulgarian in order to read uh, Dunov in the original. He was a Bulgarian uh, teacher. And part of, um, very close to, uh, be interested in your comment on this, uh, the traditionalist tradition of Fritjof Kahn and Fritjof Schoen and René Ganon and many others. Um, so I was delighted to, uh, to read this uh, remarkable book of readings. Uh, and I take it, um, is it fair to say that he is your spiritual teacher? Yes. <clears throat> um, he's, he's the one person who's had the most influence um, on my life. Um, and... I'll tell you an, an interesting story <clears throat> which re relates to that. Um, um, I had a, organized a lecture in London by, by Daskalos, um, who's um, Stelianos Stilio, Ateshlis, whose, whose work you may know. Um, he was Greek. He, he lived um, <clears throat> in, on a Greek island in Cyprus, in fact. And I said to him, we were talking over dinner, and I said to him, I feel I know you, but I... And we've worked together before, um, but I can't, I can't place it. And he said to me, in fact, he said to me just five minutes before, he said, what are you doing here? You're a Bulgarian. And I, apropos of nothing, he knew nothing about my connection <clears throat> with Peter Dunoff. And then he said, yes, Armenia. Um, we were in Armenia together. So I didn't know what, I didn't know what to make of that, but I, I had this, sense of deep connection um, with him. And I, I felt this with, um, with Bulgaria um, as well. Um, and what, so what happened initially was that I, I ordered a book in, in 1985 called Cosmic Moral Laws by his, his pupil, who was a teacher in his own right, Umram Mikhail Ivanov. And I, I liked I'd like Cosmic Moral Laws a lot. I took it on holiday and read it. And so when I got back, I, I sort of ordered the complete works 
um, you know, it's about 60 volumes of Ivanov, and sort of small books and larger books. And I started reading the first book, I think it was called A New Earth. And in chapter two, there was a chapter on, on Peter Dunoff. And as soon as I saw his face and I uh, began to read about him, I, I realized that he was really the origin of the important aspects of this teaching. And, and so I, I then ordered what I could. There was almost nothing in English. Um, but because I was teaching French, I ordered maybe half a dozen books in French. And then I discovered that there was um, uh, a little magazine called The Grain of Wheat, Le Grain de Blé. And, and so I got in contact with Anna Bertoli and I ordered all the back issues, um, which is about you know, a foot worth of, of back issues. And I read all those as well. And then I discovered that there was a Bulgarian living in my local town. And we used to go to the women's institute market on a Thursday morning. So I got to know her and I asked her whether she'd teach me Bulgarian. So for some time, I had two lessons a week, you know, learning the language. And that enabled me to um, translate his prayers <clears throat> into English, for instance. And then eventually I went there first in, in 1989, just after the wall came down. Sorry, before the wall came down. Mm. You went there, but then you continued to go back repeatedly for uh, the summer camps of his followers. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. And so the first the first time um, I went, we 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 were in a camp on the main below the main peak called Musala, which means home of the gods, incidentally. Uh, and uh, there were only about eight or nine of us um, there, and my my friend Joro. Um, had to go down every two or three days to re-register re us with the police. So the police needed to know where you were, why, why, why you were where you were. And then so it took him half a day to walk, walk, go down, come back up again. And so that was the sort of conditions at the time. And then <clears throat> um, we lived a very simple life um, for a few days, a life of prayer, um, of dance, of walks, of getting up for the sunrise, of music and just being in nature and in really unspoiled nature, which was very, very important because nature was hugely important. He was maybe one of the first people in the 1920s to, to engage in what we would now call eco-spirituality. It wasn't such a thing in, the, in those days, but being in the mountains, understanding nature as a living process, moving harmoniously in the panurhythmic dance, these were all, or these are all essential aspects of, of the camp. And you connect his work in a way I'd love to have you tell us about with the, the Cathar movement and tradition uh, of Christianity. And in fact, you live in a Cathar uh, region of France, which I believe is not an accident. How does uh, Dunov connect with the Cathars and to what degree was your choice of where you live uh, connected with the Cathar relationship with Duna? Well, the, the, the common element um, was the, the earlier parallels between the, the Bogomils in Bulgaria and, and the Cathars in Languedoc in southwest France. And, and if you go back to the sort of 10th, 11th century, the the Bogomils were the heretics of their day. Um, they were the, the prophetic element who were critical of tradition, um, of priests, um, of anything doctrinaire, um, because for them, um, it was the living spirit um, that mattered. And in fact, what happened in 1167, um, a Bog Bogomil bishop called Nicetas um, <clears throat> came to a congress with the Cathars uh, in Saint Felix, which is about an hour away from here. And, and they, they, they sort of set up some of the structure of the church. Um, so they, they, they had this Gnostic element um, in common, and the Church of the Holy Spirit, you could, you could call it in that sense. And they, they also, um, particularly in the Cathar area, um, the, those 
a women had an active role. And so they could be initiates or priestesses, if you like, uh, in the same way that men could. Um, and this still isn't even true even today in the in the Catholic Church. And so the, the sort of underground um, heretical movement of the spirit, uh, which represents, I'd say, the prophetic, the spirit, uh, against the law and, and the letter. And um, because there's always a tendency in human affairs uh, for things to become congealed. So the spirit congeals into the letter and regulations and laws, and then you're told what to do, and you get salvation by, by doing what you're told. And so there's, this, there's an independence there. And when I first came down here, in fact, what with um, Sir George Trevelyan in the late 1980s, uh, there was a feeling of being at home. And, and so I, by a number of circumstances, I, I finished up being down here again. And, and um, you know, I bought a house here and I don't expect to be moving anywhere else anytime soon. Um, and so it's a, it's a profound <clears throat> um, spiritual link, um, I think. And so I could see how, how these two movements um, were parallels. And therefore, there's also a parallel between the Bogomils um, of the 11th century and, and the Dunoff movement um, of the 20th century. So let me try something on you. Um... Is there, as you look at your life, going back to childhood where you were not part of the crowd, you were sensitive, you got bullied, um, and, uh, you, but you learned to stand on your own feet as opposed to the crowd. And then you end up with a deep interest in the human spirit and spiritual traditions and uh, and the, the survival of the soul and a whole series of things which actually are censored in our day by, uh, uh, by Wikipedia, by uh, the internet, uh, lots of forms of censorship of, uh, of these things. Um, and, um, and your uh, deep, uh, resonance with the uh, uh, Cathar and the uh, uh, movement out of Bulgaria, um, uh, which represented pure spirit as opposed to the letter of the law. In other words, this is, as we both know, the constant tension between the esoteric and the exoteric. Mm -hmm. Uh, and many people talk about that. The, the uh, traditionalists, which I've shown, who we both know, talk about that. Brother David Steindlerast is explicit about that, another friend that we have in common. Uh, but do you see a kind of a, a through line in your life from being a sensitive child who uh, was bullied uh, and wasn't part of the crowd and then ending up again, uh, standing against the crowd, uh, against uh, new forms of censorship, uh, embracing uh, a, a pure spirituality of, of Dunov uh, and the Cathars against the uh, exoteric traditions. I'm just trying that out on you. Yes, um, I think I think there is, in a, there is a sense in which I'm, I'm a heretic in many different ways. Um, respect. So I do I identify with that, but then hierine in Greek means to choose. And so it's a free choice. A heretic was one who chose their own view uh, rather than adopting the view <clears throat> they were told to adopt by the authorities. And so gnosis itself is actually profoundly countercultural and anti-authoritarian. Um, because if you have a realization of the oneness of being yourself um, or oneness with being, you don't need the church to um, give you a guaranteed pass to salvation. Um, and there's, there's, so there's a tension as well between mysticism and, and the church, between personal spiritual experience and, and doctrine or the hardening of one um, into the other. So I, I also feel that 
we all go through a process, um, especially in relation to matters of the spirit, of, of remembering. Um, and so I, I didn't feel I really remembered who I was um, until my late 20s. And so you have a shift of identity away from limited social and family roles into something more universal, what um, Barbara Marx Hubbard calls the homo universal, universalis, or Sir George used to call homo mulia noeticus, the noetic um, human being. So I feel that the recovery of gnosis, also in relation to science, um, is extremely important culturally because gnosis is direct knowing, um, whereas reason and, and the sense senses uh, are, are indirect. Um, their gnosis con corresponds in that sense to contemplation, um, whereas science is observation, where you detach yourself rather than in involve yourself in the experience. Hmm. I knew of your work for many, many years because uh, we've walked parallel paths in uh, California and um, the UK and southern France where you find yourself. But the first time I found myself mesmerized by your work was when I received um, uh, a hardback copy. I bought a hardback copy of your book on Prince Charles, The Radical Prince. Uh, then it was issued in a, a shorter version, which I, I, I was grateful to see, but I am always grateful that I had the original uh, at greater length. Uh, I found that book, and it was translated into many languages, I found that book absolutely extraordinary. And um, let me just start with this question. How well do you know Prince Charles? Quite well. <clears throat> I mean, I haven't actually seen him um, for a number of years, partly because I no longer live in Scotland. I used to go and visit him um, you know, once or twice a year uh, at Burke Hall you know, up in Aberdeenshire. Um, but I, 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 I have a, I keep a regular correspondence up with him, and I send him. He's been receiving the Network Journal Paradigm Explorer for twenty five years, and I annotate what I think will be of particular interest to him. And I also organised a conference for his seventieth birthday um, in Canterbury Cathedral. And so, what what I want to stress though is that the book was not written on the basis of conversations with with the Prince of Wales but rather everything that's in the book is in the public domain. You know, so all his speeches, um, his, his written work, and his work on gardening and agriculture and all the different areas that he's involved in. But I suppose the, the most profound connection with him is this platonic or neoplatonic um, tradition and, and his being patron of the Temenos Academy. Um, and he had a very extensive correspondence with Kathleen Rain, who was the poet who founded the Temenos Academy. So he has this deep commitment to the good, the beautiful, and the true, uh, and also to the sacred, the sense of the sacred, sense of being connected with the earth, um, and, and transcendence. So this is really um, represents his being, um, if you like. So we, as it were, meet um, at that level. Um, in terms of common concerns. What really struck me so hard, and again, you and I know this because we experience the censorship uh, that takes place with, um, uh, you know, studies of near-death experiences or psi phenomena and that kind of thing. Um, or I don't want to say censorship. Well, in some cases it is censorship. I mean, certainly it is true that in the field I work a lot in, in integrative medicine, uh, uh, you know, Google uh, just takes a lot of uh, dissenting views down. I mean, the most obvious one right now is on COVID-19. And uh, if you stray from the party line on COVID-19, your, your site suffers as a result uh, in a major way. Uh, but, uh, and because we do a lot of work on integrative cancer therapies over, you know, that's been my principal field for over 35 years. 
I'm really aware not only of the cultural biases, but also of the active uh, forms of uh, discouragement, shall we say, instead of censorship uh, that are created by the algorithms that Google and Facebook and others use. Um, so what brought that to mind is that um, in the media, uh, at least in the United States, uh, but Prince Charles is so badly treated, uh, you know, and, and yet I read your book and I realized this is a very deeply extraordinary man. Uh, now, it wasn't the first hint of that. You know, when I was uh, traveling in Europe before I started the Commonwealth Cancer Health Program 34 years ago and the preceding few years, I traveled extensively in Europe and around the world looking at integrative cancer centers. And one of the, actually, the two that struck me most deeply, one was the Lucas Clinic in Alzheimer's, Switzerland, which was an anthroposophical clinic. Mm -hmm. And the other was the Bristol Cancer Help Center, which Prince Charles inaugurated. Yes, and, indeed. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I met... Um, the folks who started the Bristol Center and Penny Braun and and they told me that Prince Charles, they had actually opened more or less recently and they told me that Prince Charles had inaugurated it. So I had that sense of him. But your book uh, just uh, demonstrates how extraordinarily far from reality the caricatures that we get in the media of people so often are. Absolutely. And I think he he's someone who has suffered a lot from, you know, misinformation, disinformation, publicity. Uh, and of course, if you don't adopt the mainstream view, um, then you expose yourself to that kind of um, criticism and even ridicule um, that uh, they were all too familiar with. Uh, but what I was trying to do there was to show that <clears throat> all his work no, it comes from this coherent philosophical base where you have the perennial philosophy, you know, it's rooted in the perennial philosophy. And, and then you, you see the correspondences between holistic science, um, holistic medicine, um, and eco-agriculture, -agri organic agriculture. So he's a patron of the Soil Association <clears throat> as well. And one of his great speeches was the 50th anniversary of the Soil Association in 1996. <clears throat> and so, and, and this is so there's a coherence, there's an alternative coherence um, to his philosophy, which is very much what many members of the scientific and medical network um, would also espouse in, in general terms. And that's what I wanted to put across. Um, so to, to, to show this. And then in his own book, Harmony, um, which was published, I think, in 10 years ago now, then he was able to set this out um, along with his co-authors in, in considerable detail. And, and so what he criticizes most strongly is this mechanistic metaphor, whether it's applied in science, agriculture, um, or medicine. And, and the implications uh, of that, of the mechanistic view of the human being, and as opposed to an organic or transcendent view of the human being. And I think this is a particularly urgent issue now, um, especially with the speed at which AI and other technologies are advancing and the conventional scientific view that we are just biological machines, or, albeit sophisticated ones, but there's no real difference between a computer and a human being. One's carbon and the other's silicon. Absolutely. Uh, you were kind enough to uh, send me a PDF of your forthcoming uh, book, um, A Quest for Wisdom, Inspiring Purpose on the Path of Life. And um, I found the organizational structure, basically it's a set of essays that you've written over many years. Uh, and I found the structure very interesting. Uh, the first was formative background about your history. The second set of essays was on philosophy, spirituality, and meaning. I mean, the first set of essays after the formative uh, background. Then the second set 
is on consciousness, death, and transformation. And the third is on taking responsibility, ethics, and society. And what actually, how can I say this? Um, what moved me forward on my journey is the third segment. Because the first segment where you start with Viktor Frankl and you talk about uh, Peter Dunov, uh, uh, that was all deeply familiar to me. And the second segment on uh, consciousness, death, and transformation, where you draw the lines between near-death experiences in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and Swedenborg and soul survival and uh, uh, Radhakrishnan and David Bohm on the Amplicate Order uh, and, and so on. Um, but uh, in the third segment, you're talking about Albert Schweitzer and reverence for life, uh, the ethical mysticism of Doug, Doug Hammarskjöld the, the, uh, uh, of the United Nations, uh, a essay on Voltaire and Russell against fanaticism uh, and toward a culture of love. And what happened for me, David, it's, it's actually potentially significant in my life, is that, um, how can I put this? I describe myself when people ask me, I have two descriptions. <laughs> and then they're both sort of tongue in cheek, but they're real. One is a Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, yogic, Sufi with Taoist influences. Great. <laughs> in the sense that each of those traditions, except Taoism, have deeply opened to me over 50 years of studying uh, their esoteric dimensions, Judaism, mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. Buddhism, the yoga tradition, uh, and the Sufi tradition. Um, but the... Um, but what I have, and the second self-description is I describe myself as a radically imperfect human being with a few useful skills, mm. which, uh, which I believe that. to be true. I believe to be true. But part of that radically imperfect human being with a few useful skills is that it kind of lets me off the hook on ethics. Uh, it it enables me to say, you know, I'm a very imperfect human being and, and I accept all of my subpersonalities in Roberto S. Joli's sense. I accept all the different impulses that live within me. When Goethe said, uh, whoever said there are two uh, souls contending in us underestimated mm -hmm. the number by a great deal. So my sort of embrace of the multiplicity of selves within us, I think kind of lets me off the hook on ethics. And I think that in contrast to your focus on purity through Dunov and, and through the Cathars uh, and through, what I can't pronounce, is it a Bogavils? Is it, how do you say Bogomils. that? Bogomils. 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 Hmm. Cathars, the Boga Mills, and, and Dunov, you really have embraced an ethic of purity and its deep connection to the esoteric tradition. I've embraced the esoteric tradition, but I haven't, and don't know if I can, challenge myself to live up to those purities. So what you were doing with that segment, the way it came into me at age 77, is saying, you know what? Um, there are some people who really took uh, ethics deeply seriously, and that's the place that I've. That's where my sense of my own radical imperfection comes in. That I can readily follow it up into the mystical, uh, into the esoteric, but when it comes to living that either in my personal life or my aspirations for the planet, um, I fall short. So that segment was particularly meaningful in my own internal inquiry. 
Very, very interesting. I mean, I think, I mean, we all fall short, uh, society falls short, uh, but that's the difference between reality and ideals. Mm -hmm. And and I I think that, I mean, Schweitzer, there's a short book um, of his, there's there's two books, meant to be a third one, but he never managed to finish it. There's Decay and Restoration of Civilization. And then his second book um, is Civilization and Ethics. And the first one came out in 1923, so only six years after the decline of the West um, by, by Spengler, and who was one of the first people to start thinking about the cyclical nature um, of civilizations, which was then taken forward by Arnold Toynbee um, in his monumental study of history, and also Peter M. Sorokin um, in um, his social dynamics. But the book I read was The Crisis of Our Age, so I'm very interested in, in this notion of the decay and restoration of culture um, or of civilization and what the symptoms are. Um, I'm, I've also read more recently the books of William Ophuls, what the symptoms are of this decay and, and how things can be restored or renewed. And I think we need to be asking ourselves this question as a culture and civilization and, and asking ourselves, what are the principles on which our lives and our societies and our cultures are based? And if you, if you look at the, it's, the, the world is run by force and violence and compulsion um, in terms of its structures and secrecy. It's one of the reasons I mentioned this in my, um, <clears throat> um, my poem. And, and it's the world in the sense that also I think Jesus understood it um, when he said you can only serve, you can't serve two masters, you can't serve the world and serve God at the same time. If by the world is meant the, the material, the, the corrupt, um, the, the, the acquisitive, the greed, um, no, the seven deadly sins, um, if you like. And, and I suppose you could put the polarity quite clearly by saying it's power or love. And power by power, I mean compulsing, com- compelling power. And I've been reading just recently the new book by David Ray Griffin, um, which is Reinhold Niebuhr on global democracy. And one of the themes that runs through it, I haven't finished it yet, um, is how do you combine power with goodness? That, I suppose, is Carl, Jung, Carl Jung, famous, I think it was Jung, who said, where there is power, there is no love. Where there is love, there is no power. Something like that. That mm-hmm. How do you combine power and love is uh, actually something I was uh, thinking about and writing about in college. And it still remains one of the great dilemmas of my life. Indeed. And I, and I, I think that's, uh, and I suppose you're, you're coming back to these principles. And I was very struck when I was, I, mean, I originally came to Schweitzer via his organ music, but not, not his books. I only came later to his autobiography and then his books and his work. And, and, but this ethic of reverence for life, Erfurcht vor dem Leben um, in, in German, um, was a, a, profound, a profound ethical principle, which if, if we applied that now, um, then you could you could start working out its implications. I mean, it would be consistent, for instance, with what I believe we need to do uh, in relation to nature, which is regenerative, which is to regenerate nature, not just to sustain things as they are, because that's not that's not good enough. And if we regenerate, if we go with the regenerative energies of nature, um, then nature will help, and then that's how nature works. Nature dies and then is reborn. I want to read some of the quotes uh, in support of A Quest for Wisdom. Um, This is from Larry Dossie, a mutual friend. For years, I've had a personal rule, read anything David Lorimer writes. I've benefited from David's insight for decades. A Quest for Wisdom is his latest and most profound contribution, a summing up of accumulated wisdom. Lorimer is a rare cultural treasure. I hope your Quest for Wisdom includes this great book. 
And then from Richard Tarnas, who we also both know, um, I know his work and have done a, a new school conversation with him. What a blessing David Lorimer's work has been for many fellow seekers over several de past several decades. And it goes on at considerable length. Um, uh, from um, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who we both know well, David Lorimer's far-ranging inquiries have taken him through many realms of science, spirituality, and philosophy. He has read more books on these subjects than anyone I know, which is quite a statement coming from Rupert, and knows most of the leading thinkers in these fields. This book brings together some of his reflections previously scattered in various publications. It is an invaluable resource and a perfect bedside book. Ian McElchrist, the neuroscientist and philosopher and author of The Master and His Emissary, which uh, you, you quote, David Lorimer is just the sort of thinker that is today all too rare, hugely well-read, unstuffy, interested in philosophy in the best sense. In the course of these essays spanning 40 years, he asked most of the big questions about the nature and meaning of life with an accent on spiritual understanding and drawing on a wide range of resources. Uh, uh, and uh, Irvin Laszlo, another critical person for both of us, the quest is of paramount importance. The substance of it is presented in this book is fascinating and meaningful. The book as a whole is great and even essential reading for our critical times. Satish Kumar, there is too much information and a lot of knowledge uh, in our contemporary world, but sadly, very little wisdom. And he talks about a quest for wisdom is so wonderful. Uh, so it goes on like that. Many thinkers I don't know, but many I do. And, um, and I, I want to just therefore take a moment to go into uh, some of the uh, essays just to kind of highlight who you're talking about. So in, in the philosophy, spirituality, and meaning segment, you start with Viktor Frankl. Why do you start with Viktor Frankl? Well, <clears throat> that was a hugely important book uh, for me, Man's Search for Meaning, which I must have read um, three or four times, and there's, his, there's a new book that's come out called Yes to Life, and I'm trying, I've got in my computer, but I haven't actually read it yet, so it's sort of on my pending list. And, and I think if you use your imagination when you're reading this book about his account of Auschwitz and how he got through it existentially, and quoting Nietzsche, what does not kill me makes me stronger, and, and just imagining yourself surviving and getting through that awful experience of human cruelty and indifference. Um, then it, and the centrality of love, love for his wife, that's really what got him, it got him through. Uh, and so this, was a, this, this whole question of meaning has been something which has been a leitmotif um, for, you know, for, you know, throughout my, my whole life, if you like. And I'd just like to relate something to um, this Auschwitz, um, which was a visit I took to Buchenwald. And this, this was this concentration camp outside Weimar. And so I spent the morning looking at Goethe's house. Go Goethe, I'm a great admirer of Goethe and Goethe's poetry and, and his, his other philosophical writings. <clears throat> and in the afternoon, I went to, uh, to, to um, Buchenwald and in it, I found some barbed wire, and I took some barbed wire with me, and a nail, which sort of represented um, symbolically this. And I went into the area next to the incinerator, and in a small room, I thought to myself, I wonder if anybody who was here in the 1940s left any messages. And so I knelt down and had a look, and I found one. And it was just in points. It must have been a drawing pin or a stone or something sharp. And it just had three words in French. It said, croire, espérer, prier. To believe, to hope, to pray. And I was so moved by this, as you can imagine. And a man came in just at that moment. And I said, come and have a look at this. It says, croire, 
espere, prie. And he said, ach ja, glauben, hoffen, beten, um, which of course is the, the German um, equivalent, which sort of started me out of my, my contemplation there. But um, I realized this extreme of suffering um, that some people were put through. And you get this sense in Poland, particularly, because Poland had been invaded so many times, invaded in the First World War, invaded in the Second World War, and people's lives were just completely taken away from them. And, and you have to be grateful if that hasn't happened to you. And so you've got this comparison yardstick of the most awful things that humans can do to each other. And yet, it's still possible to transmute that into that suffering, in, into love and compassion. My father was a, a war correspondent who went into Auschwitz with the American troops when they liberated it. And he talked with some of the survivors and they told him that his village had been, his, his natal vis, vil, village uh, in the Russian-Polish uh, border area, uh, that all, everyone had died at Auschwitz there. Um, and I had that experience of, of um, of experiencing what Auschwitz was like. Um, one of the interesting things about Frankel, who is significant for me as well, is um, I have a, a wonderful young friend, Anna Lena Butcher, who is a philosophy and psychology student in, um, in Austria. And it's so interesting to me that the uh, that existential psychology is a big deal in the German Swiss world. And Frankel is central to their existential psychology. And what I think Frankel provides by being a Jewish philosopher who survived Auschwitz is he provides a bridge from the incredible richness of the German Austrian cultural tradition into the present, which Carl Jung, for example, who flirted with Nazism, they can't touch. They can't touch, in other words, Jung, you know, if it, you are a heretic in Germany, if you're into Jungian psychology. Uh, but Frankel uh, is one of the people who provides that bridge from this incredibly rich cultural past through the Nazi period to import, you know, some of that that power, um, and and uh, so I, I had been acquainted with Frankel for a long time, but through my friend and colleague Annalena, I've been fascinated to see how rich that tradition presently is in that part of the world. No, that's that's very interesting. I mean, my own, uh, you see in one of the other essays that I, I compare him with Camus, because I was studying Camus, also sort of existentialist philosopher, novelist, if you like, at St. Andrews, along with Sartre. <clears throat> and and these, are, these are people who say, well, life is devoid of meaning. And, and so and it's absurd. And, and so the absurd and the mysterious, which is one of the essays, there's a contrast between um, Frankel and, and Camus. And I think Camus was actually a, a profound thinker, you know, from his own angle. Um, and I love his plays as well, Les Justes, you know, where, where he, he arranges for the assassin of the Archduke um, or, the, or the Tsar, you know, to have a conversation with a widow. Why did, why did you do this? Um, he was my husband and he was a human being. And, and that's, I think, that the danger is, is that these ideologies... Um, enable you to forget your humanity. I mean, Russell and Einstein famously said in their manifesto against nuclear weapons, remember your humanity and forget the rest. One of the things that's really interesting to me is whether the metaphor, the secular metaphor of human values is superior or inferior in terms of human consciousness to the spiritual consciousness that we've been discussing. In this sense, 
Viktor Frankl's quest for meaning or the word purpose, those can be interpreted in secular terms for people who have no interest in religion and spirituality. And they can go to profound depth in secular terms. One might even say the esoteric dimensions of the secular tradition with language like meaning uh, purpose. Whereas the spiritual traditions in some sense insist that the esoteric flame in the traditionalist view is what keeps everything alight and that the traditionalists, you know, um, uh, Ibn Arabi, who I spent a lot of time with, uh, says that in the Sufi tradition, there's a saying, don't strike at the face, meaning don't criticize the mainstream exoteric thing. It is the holder of the esoteric flame. And um, people uh, like Brother David say that there's, as you said too, there's a tension between the esoteric frame, the exoteric form. And a, a religion's fate depends on how well it manages that tension. If the exotericists extinguish the esoteric flame, the religion will die. If the esotericists strike at the face of the exoteric form, uh, there's all kinds of trouble too. Uh, what reflections do you have on that question of human, humanist, humanist, humanist values without, without relate, which, which denigrates into materialism, but at first was deist, right? Mm, in, well. its, in its values. And so in your view, how do you hold this tension between the high dimensions of humanism, the high dimensions of esotericism, and their degraded forms of uh, materialism and, uh, you know, religious fundamentalism? Well, I think you probably have to go back to the Renaissance <clears throat> and, you know, and the, the Florentine Renaissance and the revival of the classics and, and the discovery of these hermetic texts, you know, with Pico and, and, and others. And, and this was returning to a, a source of wisdom, a source of gnosis um, also, at a time when the metaphor was, was still the anima mundi, so the world was still in soul. And then along comes the, um, the mechanistic 17th century scientific revolution. The metaphor changes. The metaphor changes into a machine, in, into mechanism. And then the human being gradually gets subsumed into this mechanistic category. And the, the various forms of technology are used to explain the human being. Um, so now we've reached the computer. And, and and artificial intelligence. And yet the computer is something that we ourselves created. And Rupert Sheldrake calls this mechanomorphism <clears throat> as opposed to anthropomorphism. And so the the science was was reacting against the dogmatic restrictions of the exoteric and um, of the church. And, and also they're straying into what they were regarded as, as uh, scientific areas. And, and, and this, this basis of knowledge in theology. And I think what's also interesting is that the development of scholasticism um, you know, with Aquinas and others sharpened the tool of reason, which was then used against the church and its doctrines and its epistemology and its ontology um, by the rising forces of science. And so science had to emancipate itself um, with these, these humanist values and the idea of progress, um, which is allied very much to the scientific view and was developed in the 18th century. So you didn't want to go back to something to find the perfect state, but rather forwards. And then you get that uh, expressed also in evolution. Um, and also by, let's say, Alfred Russell Wallace, he brings into spiritual evolution. And then, then you get the, the congealing of this, as you've just said, into, into materialism and atheism. Um, which assumes that the, the physical world and the outer objective um, method is the only way of any way of knowing, any way of securing um, true knowledge, and to the exclusion 
of this inner. And then we, we're at a very interesting point now um, because science is grappling with consciousness. And an increasing number of people, and this is the mission of the Galileo Commission, are beginning to realize that they can't reduce consciousness to something else. Consciousness has to be primary or fundamental um, in a sense. And as Max Planck um, famously stated you know, 90 years ago, if I regard consciousness as fundamental, um, because people are realizing that you can't explain consciousness from the outside like you can explain a fruit um, or a rock. Um, or some, something that you can you can weigh and measure and see. And it's the very faculty of knowing. Consciousness is the very faculty of knowing and understanding. And, and so, so I, I see um, a new synthesis gradually emerging. And it's one that is more open to spiritual insight. Um, because as soon as you say that consciousness is fundamental and primary, then maybe consciousness can access these deeper structures, which is what's suggested in the Galileo report, and, and which is manifest in, in the history of spiritual experience and the experience of, of love light, um, which is these two things go together. So in a near-death experience or a mystical experience, people don't just experience light. They experience light infused by love or love infused by light. And this, to me, seems to be um, the ontological core uh, and also our ontological identity, because I believe that uh, at, at the core, uh, we are, in fact, all one. We are all expressions of the same cosmic consciousness or universal mind. Mm, beautiful. Uh, there's so many directions I'd like to take that, but let me just say a little more about the Galileo report. When was it published and what is it? Well, we, we published it in, in, this is the Scientific and Medical Network, we published it in 2018. It's written by Professor Harold Wallach, um, who has a very wide range of, of expertise in history and philosophy of science, complementary medicine, parapsychology, physics, um, sociology of science, and so on. And so he was able to look at um, the larger picture, also historically, um, so as to, to, to make it very clear um, that science is not independent of philosophy. Science rests on philosophical assumptions and also on the whole notion of logic and reason, um, which derives from you know, philosophy. And so the positivists in the 1930s, they thought they could be independent of, of metaphysics and metaphysics was nonsense. And in the 1940s, a book came out called Essay on Metaphysics by Robin Collingwood, who was the professor of metaphysics at Oxford. And that, that is a, a kind of demolition of the, the positivist view and that, that you can do away with metaphysics. And so this materialism and reductionism and, and, and the analytical method, but particularly the materialism, the scientism, the, 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 the notion that only scientific knowledge as currently constituted um, is valid. This is what we're calling into question. And in particular, and this is the essence of it, I think, um, the assumption that the brain gives rise to consciousness. And this, this is, this, this is the, the sort of epicenter of neuroscience, philosophy, and psychology. And it's simply taken for granted. It's called the hard problem. You know, do, you don't ask um, how our brain and consciousness or mind and mind and brain connected, like William James, you say um, it's obvious um, that the mind is a product of the brain. And therefore, you know, there can be no survival, memories of reincarnation, and so on. So this is one of the reasons why these areas are, are so controversial, because they call into question the adequacy of materialistic of scientific materialism as a philosophy. Absolutely. And so before I go deeper into that, uh, we were just talking about the relationship of love and wisdom. Uh, uh, Dunov has both three and five uh, core formulations. Um, uh, 
of, of, of basic principles. Could you describe the three and then the, uh, the expansion of that into five principles? Yes. Um, so the three principles are love, wisdom, and truth. Right. Um, love brings warmth to the heart. Uh, wisdom brings light to the mind. And truth brings freedom and strength to the will. And, right. and just, to, just to mention that these are also coded into the panurhythmy. And so, for instance, in movement 11, which is called Evera, you, you turn to the, the center, um, which is turning to love, and then you turn to the periphery, which is turning to wisdom, and then you make a movement forward in truth. So combining love and wisdom enables you to step forward in truth. So these are, these are symbolic, and, and, and also he wrote the music um, for them as well. And then making up the pentagram, which is the central symbol um, of the Dunov teaching, is justice and goodness um, or virtue. And I'll just give you a formula, um, which I think is very powerful and which I use <clears throat> on a regular basis. May I be as pure as light, as transparent as water, as abundant as love, as radiant as truth, as harmonious as wisdom, as firm and unshakable as justice, and as stable as virtue. So this kind of sums up um, the relationship of these, these principles. And the third part of the panurhythmy, this sacred dance, meaning universal harmony of movement, is the pentagram. Um, where you dance symbolically around the sides of the pentagram, representing the five principles. It sounds a lot like Gurdjieff. Yes, I've read a bit about um, Gurdjieff move, Gurdjieff's movements, and I think it's it's similar in the sense that one is translating a meaning or a symbol into movement. Um, but I think with the panurhythmy, you're... You're, it's it's more because um, the three levels of interconnectedness in the panurhythmy are the connectedness with the angelic spiritual world, which is the vertical upwards, the connection with the earth, and um, particularly if you do it on bare feet, um, downwards, and then the horizontal connection between the players, the, the the dancers, and also the musicians who are always at the center. So this is a huge wheel. Um, if you like. Um, and it goes through all these phases of 28 movements in the first part, and then the sunbeams, which is the second part, which is all about moving from the one to the many, and back, the many back to the one, which is the move, movement of the spiritual life, I think. And the third part, which I just described, is, is the pentagram, where you imagine yourself as a ray of the sun, uh, just as Dunov had the pentagram, um, Gurdjieff had the enneagram. Are you familiar with that? Yes, it's not something I've studied in enormous detail, but I do have a couple of books on the enneagram. But I think it's something that you know a lot better, isn't it? I, well, it's an interesting story. I, I have spent years studying enneagram, um, but um, the point here is that it's a nine-pointed. Um, uh, circle as opposed to a five-pointed one. But the point here is Gurdjieff has a great line that if a man were alone and uh, in the desert and, and drew the enneagram in the sand, that it contains the sum total of all possible wisdom and that he could spend his life studying uh, the depth of that. I, I won't go into the, the many dimensions of enneagram that, that where we could go. But what I do want to focus in, and I think is really critically important, because I think we share this deeply in, in common. One of your essays is called The Religious and Scientific Implications of Near-Death and Related Experiences. And then another one is called Aspects of the Near-Death Experience in the Light of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Experiences of Swedenborg. And then you have two others, Swedenborg and Survival, Swedenborg, the soul and modern consciousness studies, and then in addition, the near-death experience and the perennial wisdom. So this is, I mean, there's so many parallels. So for example, when people ask me what are 
core values are at Commonweal, I say con- kindness, consciousness, and dedication to the work. Kindness mm. is love with its work boots on. Consciousness is applied wisdom. And dedication to the work is the service that comes out of the will. So it's, you know, love, wisdom, and will. It's the same mm. triad, which, of course, you find in all the great spiritual traditions. You do. Not perhaps all, but in almost all. You know, uh, faith, hope, and charity is a, is another dimension of it. The, the true, the be- good, and the beautiful. So one can get this, this. After all, what are we all given? We're given our head, our hearts, and our hands. You get, find this in Rudolf Steiner. You find it everywhere. So that, you know, that's that's a shared value. But going into this in the course of a life where one has the kinds of curiosities that you and I have and the kinds of orientation toward the human spirit, um, and I've worked with cancer patients for 34 years, and you know what? I started out agnostic about whether the soul survived death and just the accretion of experiences plus the study of the literature on near-death experiences, um, made it seem to me more and more and more and more probable that the soul survives death. Now, can I state it as an incontrovertible fact? No, I can't. But does the great preponderance of evidence suggest that to me? And is it part of my own choice to believe that to be the truth. Yes, it is. So then I connect, well, if near-death experiences are real, then in some sense, the survival of the soul, as we've said, is real. And how does that relate to psi phenomena, you know, uh, and to the whole range of remote viewing, remote sensing, uh, distance healing, the efficacy of prayer, which Larry Dossie has written so much about, And so if you follow these things through, they create a pattern of what you're describing as an emerging reality in response to the mechanistic materialist paradigm that we're living in. And then again, you see, I see this kind of race between the immense self-destructive capacity of the human species and the emergence of this old, new remembrance, recognition. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> and I know I think we're at a, we're at a critical point um, in that, that process. And, and I think that it's the patterns which you gradually build up or out of which you, you, you gain an understanding. So, for instance, uh, at one point I was reading hundreds of letters about near-death experiences, all sent in by different people. And yet, once you've read a couple of hundred, um, you begin to distill down the com- common patterns and the more exceptional um, aspects of it. And, and for me, there are two critical um, implications. One is the the veridical out-of-body experience where people can accurately report what was going on in, in the vicinity of their body or even elsewhere mm-hmm. you know, when, they, when they are unconscious and in some cases with a flat line. And the second is the, the mystical um, spiritual um, aspect where they, they become love and wisdom. And a third actually, which is the subject of my second book, is the life review. Um, because it seems to me that the life review at a deep level um, shows that we're all one. So that what we do to someone else, we're actually doing to ourselves. And eventually we will experience that. And that, that, that was the, 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 the argument of Whole in One, which is now called Resonant Mind. Um, and the final chapter of that was called The Near-Death Experience and an Ethic of Interconnectedness. And what I do is I show that you can arrive there from science, um, from psychology, or from spirituality, with the same structure of implications, this ethic of interconnectedness, based on oneness of life and the oneness of mind. And so it seemed to me, and it still does, um, that if people 
realized that this is how the universe works, um, that you re-experience things from the point of view, from multiple points of view, not only from your own. Then just this morning, give you an instance of it, I was listening to my daughter's podcast on, on Alexei Navalny, you know, who was poisoned by the, the Russian government. And, and as the story continues. But the idea that you can be responsible for, with impunity, for poisoning someone is metaphysical nonsense. Eventually, it'll come back and you will have to experience what it was like to be poisoned and, or what it was like to blow a hotel up in Vietnam, which is Danny and Brinkley's um, example, what, what ripple effects that had on other human beings. So if we were taught that the, univer the universal mind is one, we're all one mind, we're all, we are one another, and then all this ethic of reverence for life, the golden rule, it just falls straight out of it. And then we would think twice before we started harming other people or deceiving them or killing them or torturing them. And, and, I, and I think this point you know, couldn't be more important in the, the situation that we're, we're currently in. Yes, that was another area that you really contributed to my thinking because I certainly knew about the phenomenon of life review and near-death experiences, but I hadn't really taken in the ethical imperative intrinsic in the life review that you experience what you did to other people and you experience the pain that you inflicted. And so given that the near-death experience is real, uh, given that the survival of the soul uh, seems highly likely, the near-death near experience is empirically real. The, the survival of the soul seems highly likely, if not certain, it's certainly something I, I choose to believe is highly likely. The, near, the, the life review contains the ethical imperative. That's what I want to come back to. That yep. the fact that the life review you experience what you did to other people suggests that in this transpersonal oneness that we are indeed responsible. Indeed. And that, that leads us to the ethical imperative. No, that, well, that's what I was trying to, to say. And, and in addition, I, I had, when I wrote the, this book, I, I also drew on you know, the work of Steiner and Peter Dunoff and others, um, and, and reports of survival, when people describe post-mortem life review. In other words, it's, this is not something that just happens in the near-death experience. There are reports of people experiencing this from, from the other side and, and then talking about it or communicating the same reality. And so I, I think if, if you were Pascal, you would say, well, I think it'd be wise to take a bet on this. Because yeah, if you're right and you, you live an ethical life, that's right. But if you're wrong, um, if there's no such thing, of course you you left the world a better place anyway. There's a wonderful formulation of that. You probably know. If you think it matters and it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter. But if you think it doesn't matter and it matters, then it matters. Yes, that's lovely. That. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that well, does encapsulate it. Yeah. Um, I'm well, let me ask you, um, what areas of your work and thinking that you would like to capture have we not touched on yet? Well, I think we've touched on on a great deal. Um, and obviously, a, a conversation is something organic, so that some things come up or some things are more emphasized than others. But I think, We've covered um, a lot of the most essential ground, um, as far as I can I can see. So here's a question that I haven't asked you yet. You've spoken of Dunoff as your principal uh, teacher. Uh, we've spoken of the immense literature that you've covered. We've spoken of the effort to um, see our way into uh, a oneness of consciousness that would 
bring us out of the mechanistic power-based death oriented world that we're living in. So I have actually two final questions. I'll start with the first one. As you know, from participating in one of our Omega Resilience Funders Network uh, webinars, uh, I am preoccupied with what is sometimes called the global problematique, the human dilemma, uh, the, the global poly crisis. I'm preoccupied with the reality that several dozen global stressors, um, environmental, social, technological, financial, economic, are interacting with increasing velocity, creating completely unpredictable outcomes with increasing force and frequency. And that the specialists in biodiversity tell us without question that we are in a bottleneck of uh, biodiversity evolution, evolutionary biology, in which only a portion of uh, 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 biodiversity and question of humanity will come through this bottleneck. So that leads to very dire projections about the human future on the one hand, then there are the techno-optimists who believe we're going to work all this out. Um, but even if we imagine a spiritual transformation, the reality of how much of biodiversity will be destroyed in this bottleneck is, is just real. It's unquestionable. And the question of what nature of humanity will come through the, bio, uh, the bottleneck, if any, or what will be the successor species is real. How deeply, when you think about the crisis, how deeply do you encompass what I regard as that reality in your own thinking? Or do you think I'm being too dire? <clears throat> no, no, I'm afraid not. Yeah. And, and I referred to that in my poem um, about grief for a lost future. Mm -hmm. grief at the short-sightedness of humanity and at not understanding the big picture, of not of working against nature instead of working with nature, of thinking that we can manipulate our way out of the crisis that we've created through that particular way of thinking. And, and so I, I feel, um, I feel I, we have to be ethically optimistic, even if you're scientifically pessimistic. And because I think optimism is, um, is actually a, um, an ethical imperative. However, and, and I wrote about this in the last chapter of a book that Jason Drew and I published in 2011 called The Protein Crunch, um, about the structure of these <clears throat> um, environmental books. Because what you would, what you typically get is eleven chapters of doom and gloom, and then one chapter saying if we change in time, um, then things will be okay. Mm -hmm. And my 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 friend Jonathan Porritt wrote a book last year, which you may or may not have seen, called Hope in Hell. And one of the things one of the things I said in 2011, and which he 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 repeats, is that hope is conditional. That you can only hope if you act into that hope with the necessary measures. And, and we aren't doing that. And, and the, the, the consumerist system, the uh, emphasis on economic growth um, as the only engine of the economy, which means, well, we know what it all, what it all means. Um, which is why I said earlier um, that um, we need to focus and have a regeneration revolution, as Ronnie Cummins is. Um, he, he's one of the Organic Consumers Association. <clears throat> he's just written a book um, exactly on that topic, which I'm in the process of reviewing. And so, so there's a there's and Vandana Shiva, and she says the same. And we've we've got a um, a, a, a webinar with her coming up um, on regenerating soil, regenerating health, and so the whole. The whole non-holistic view um, applied in science um, and in, in medicine and in agriculture 
which is which is based on on war with nature and manipulating nature, it's absolutely bankrupt. Even if it seems very powerful, it's not going to get us to the place we need to go. We need to go back to understanding. It's Victor Schauberger. He said, "Kapieren und kopieren." Um, nature. He said we have to understand nature and copy nature, biomimicry, uh, and so on. And so that's the kind of revolution that I think we need to promote, and which both of us indeed are promoting. But whether whether it's enough, and, and I sort of come back to the near-death experience, because if you look at um, what it takes to change someone, um, philosopher, business philosopher Jim Rohn, he said it's either inspiration or desperation. Now, those are the main reasons we change. And if, we, if business as usual would mean we have to change through desperation uh, with, with huge suffering. And this is what Chris Beish you know, sees in his visions of the future. He sees that we, we actually don't have the capacity to, um, to make the, preemptively to make the changes. And that's what gives me huge grief and sorrow. And because I think you know, at least some of us know what needs to happen. But the people who have the power, um, they're not really interested. Mm. Or if they are interested, then they, they put it into a technological frame, like the Great Reset um, of the World Economic Forum, um, which, which will entail you know, surveillance, <clears throat> track and trace. Um, you know, we, we'll all become extensions of the Internet of Things. And we'll have nothing to do because computers and robots will be doing it for us. Mm. Last question. Um, you've spoken of, uh, of Peter Dunoff as your principal, uh, the most influential uh, teacher in uh, your work. Uh, you've, we've covered a lot of the other people who've influenced you. What I haven't asked you and what you haven't really said is, in your inner spiritual life, how do you experience these teachings? I mean, do you experience Dunoff within you? Do you experience the Christ within you? Uh, is there, what is the manifestation of all your work within your own practice and contemplative life that guides you? Well, I'll just do a preliminary observation related to the previous question before I go into the, this one. And that is that he described himself as the prophet of a new culture of love and, and wisdom and, and truth. And so if, you, if, if, if as change makers we, we think to ourselves, well, maybe it won't come about in this lifetime, Nevertheless, that should be our compass direction. And that's what I would say to anybody. No, why not have that as your compass direction? I mean, you can't really go wrong. And if you add freedom and peace into those, into those three, and justice. Um, how I live this and experience it, um, I have felt, and I even as I'm speaking, I feel blessed um, by that presence of Peter Dunoff. I have a, a um, picture of him here, which are, is on my desk. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> the, the Ben Seduno is his spiritual name and the being that came through, if you like, um, Peter Dunoff. But I, I, I do these practices every day. And so in the morning, I, I say his main prayer, which is the good prayer. I actually say it in French because I learned it in French before. I can almost say it in Bulgarian as well. And then there's the morning prayer of the disciple, um, which I always say as well. And then I do, I do the symbolic movements. And, and there are different symbolic movements. But I'll just give you an idea. So the first one, which you use this kind of Im image of the hands coming down over the head, may the blessing of God descend on my soul. And the second one is, may divine love live in my soul. The third one, may divine justice grow within me. I will serve the Lord with my whole soul. I will rejoice in the blessings of the Lord and remain in perfect balance. 
I will walk in the path of truth. May the Spirit of God come and bless us. And then finally, I'm in harmony with living nature, and may the blessings of God flow through me. So I do these exercises every morning, and then I salute, send the blessing to the four directions, um, which is my own kind of addition, a sort of Native American Indian addition to, um, to that. And then we send blessings through our hand. The right hand is the emissive hand, the hand that sends out. The left hand is the rece receptive hand. And, and so, and in the morning, um, my first prayer is, is, is a prayer of gratitude. Um, and I thank thee, Lord, for life and health. Fill my heart with love and strengthen my will so that I may accomplish thy will. So that, that's, that's, that's what I start every day before I get out of bed. Um, I say that prayer um, and affirmation. And, and it stand, stands you in good stead because I think that we need to try and balance these faculties, you know, de develop the mind and wisdom, develop the heart, and also develop the will. And developing the will is something I did as a, a young man with my athletics. And I still apply that now. Um, so, so that's that's the living part of the uh, of the practice. Um, uh, just a reminder and and a connection. And in the summer, I would um, quite often do do some of the panyurithmi exercises. But those are, those only start at the equinox and they go on between the equinoxes, um, which is the time when the energy of the earth moves out rather than being in the roots. David Lorimer, writer, lecturer, editor, program director of the Scientific and Medical Network. Thank you for being with us at the New School. Well, thank you for the opportunity of this conversation, Michael. I've really enjoyed it. I hope that there will be more to come. Indeed. <laughs>